uh, is sponsoring this. This is a national uh, uh, sponsored study. And it's primary ablation versus antiarrhythmic drug in patients who have never had treatment or have had very little treatment. Some folks come in and they've had two weeks of an antiarrhythmic drug and, and they don't tolerate it and want to go to ablation. And so those folks actually can still be in this study, but it's truly patients who are coming in new diagnosis of AFib or they've had AFib but they've never been treated and which strategy is best going right to ablation versus taking a medication. It's anybody, it's if you have the in or out of AFib or you're persistently in AFib for 10 years, as long as you, as long as your physician feels that you would benefit from being back in normal rhythm, you have symptoms, you would benefit from being uh, back in normal rhythm, uh, you can get into this study. Uh, there are a few criteria that are cutoffs. You, you, if you're over 65, you get in. Um, the, if you're, if you have hypertension, diabetes, or if you've had a stroke, you can get in. So there's a few things. Not we, the the study is not taking totally healthy people um, and looking at this uh, uh, because, and to be honest, most folks who have atrial fibrillation have one or more of uh, these other risk factors. And it's looking at survival. It's looking out to three years and beyond. How do patients do? Do they live longer if you do an ablation first or if you do a medication first? Very, very important study. We'll sort of define what we do with atrial fibrillation for the next 10, 20, 30 years, I think. And, and again, we're uh, a year from finishing enrollment and maybe a, a couple more years from knowing the outcome of this trial. So what's in the future for AFib ablation? Um, a couple of things I want to highlight. I've talked about the veins and the electrical activity that comes from those veins. That's what we consider the trigger of atrial fibrillation. So the electric, electrical activity starts in those veins and then goes into the heart. But not everybody who has atrial fibrillation coming in from those veins will stay in atrial fibrillation. I can actually take any, any person, any healthy person, even a young person, into the lab, put them into atrial fibrillation by giving them enough adrenaline or pacing their heart fast enough. They will actually trigger from the veins into atrial fibrillation, but it'll last five seconds, and then it will go away. And that's because there's something in the heart muscle itself that allows AFib to continue on. And so that's what we call the substrate. There's some scarring, scar tissue, enlargement of the heart that allows the AFib that comes in from those veins to continue on, and for AFib to not last seconds, but to last hours or days or weeks or months. So that's where we're moving now, is not just looking at the triggers or the initiators of the AFib, but looking at the heart muscle itself and why does AFib continue. So what we notice early on is when we move our catheters around inside the muscle of the heart, occasionally we'll see these little clusters of electrical activity where it's very rapid, very abnormal looking electrical activity, and we call these cafes. You always have to have a fancy or an easy to remember acronym, but this is complex fractionated atrial electrograms. They don't like to say that, so we say cafes. So they have cafes all over the place, and everything with AFib is related to coffee, so our, our our Duke Center for AFib is decaf. Um, so everything is coffee related. So uh, these are cafes. We have the decaf center um, that I can talk to you about. But um, these are these very rapid, uh, abnormal electrical areas of the heart muscle. And if you map these, you find that they happen uh, in very um, reproducible locations. So here I've done ablation around those veins. And in the white, I've mapped all over the heart muscle looking for these cafes, these very rapid areas. And I've, I've found a few clusters here and a little cluster down by another vein down here, very sort of typical areas. And here, I'm actually measuring on the ablation catheter all this rapid electrical activity. And the patient was in atrial fibrillation. I got so excited. I said, come on, ablation here. Come on, ablation here. And they came on. And as soon as they did, within a second, the patient went to normal rhythm. It was amazing. It's only happened to me once. Um, but this is the type of thing that you see uh, in the heart that is independent of those veins. Uh, so, and you don't see it in everyone. And it's these cafes or these fractionated uh, electrical activity. So if you hunt out those, those pockets, um, what you find is that in patients who are in and out of AFib, they don't have as much scarring. So that it's probably not as important. But in folks who are in AFib for months, 
there's scar that starts to get deposited in the muscle. And we can find these little, these, these little pockets of, of cat phase, these little pockets of electrical activity. And patients do better. So the, the one is no better. And here, when you add on doing this extra hunting and finding these pockets, um, when you look at the studies, folks that have that done do better. They have um, uh, less AFib than folks where we just do the veins. But it's very hard to do that. It takes a lot of time. You have to move around the entire heart muscle with a little catheter. And the, you know, the heart's the size you know, of a lemon or an orange. And so we're moving all around trying to find these areas. So we now have a way of measuring the electrical activity in the muscle of the heart with one beat or in, in, in just a few seconds. Uh, and this is called FIRM, or focal impulse rotor modulation. And what we do is we put this catheter, it's called a basket catheter, inside the chamber of the heart. And it, it comes in straight, and then we open it up, and it kind of balloons out. It's, it's like a mesh catheter. It um, doesn't cause any trauma inside the heart, but it has electrodes, 64 different electrodes. And it records the electrical activity at all walls of the heart muscle in one second. And then we can process that electrical activity, and we can find these little patches, these little cafes, what, what are now, what we're now starting to call rotors. And really, truly, what you see is electrical activity that spins. Like, it's almost like a pinwheel. And you can see the electrical activity spinning around, and you can find the center of that pinwheel in the muscle of the heart, burn that, that rotor, and, and, and in many cases, stop atrial fibrillation right then. So here's a one graphical depiction of this where they've measured the electrical activity. And right in the center here, they're showing you this is where it's circling around. It's like the center of the pinwheel. Here's a video. Now, this is going to make some people seize, potentially, um, this video. But you get used to looking at these things. This is actually an electrical map of the heart um, over about a uh, four-second period. And what I'll focus you on is this white dot right here. What you see is, if you can trust me here, this electrical, this white is just, that's the, the head of the electrical activity. It's just circling around continuously. You see a lot of other junk. There's sort of some stuff circles and then it goes away. But this one up here in the upper left corner is pretty consistent. Okay, so this is what we call a driver, or driver rotor. This is driving the atrial fibrillation in the muscle. So we've already done the ablation on the, on the uh, veins. We've isolated the electrical activity coming in. But this is where the AFib perpetuates in the muscle. And so we've done this mapping now called firm mapping. And then we would direct our mapping catheter right to the center of that dot and do ablation there. And if you do that, this is all very early data. This is only within the last year or two we've started to do this. If you do that compared to just doing the veins, Patients do a lot better. Uh, here they are at almost three years. These are folks that are both persistently in AFib, mostly persistently in AFib. So the success rates, again, maybe 60, 60 to 50%. But if you add on this firm ablation going after these, these uh, uh, pockets, these rotors in the muscle, ablation success is 80% or better. So now we're starting to get somewhere. We're actually pushing on that success rate above that 60, 70, 80%. Okay, so we have this available. This is not available everywhere. It's only available a few places in the U.S., but we've been doing this type of ablation for going on a year now. Uh, it's not really experimental, although it's being researched. I think it's very early on with this, so we still have some things to work out. Um, but this is a very exciting, promising addition to uh, what we're doing right now with ablation. What else do we have? This is a, a video from Medtronic, which, has, uh, a, uh, which is a company that has a, 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 a different type of technology for isolating the electrical activity from uh, the heart. And that's uh, this, which is a balloon. Uh, and it's also freezing. It's not heating up. It's freezing. So it's called cryo or cryo balloon. And what you do is you, you put the cath same thing through the leg. Catheter goes into the heart. And then you... Uh, push this catheter into the opening of the vein, you blow up this balloon, uh, you freeze it uh, here, and that creates a seal around that vein, and that does the same thing. It, it creates scar around that tissue so that the electrical activity doesn't get in. Uh, 
Okay, and, this, and then here's that picture of that lasso catheter going in, checking the electrical activity, the balloon getting deployed into the vein. Now we're inflating it. Okay, push the push that balloon right onto the opening of that vein, and then we usually freeze for about four to five minutes per vein. Okay, and then uh, here's the the, the um, nitrous oxide going into the uh, balloon, and then you take it out. So the idea here is. Well, if we're not heating up the tissue, we have maybe less collateral damage. We, you know, as I mentioned, there's a lot of other organs around the heart. Um, so per perhaps there's improved safety with this by freezing and not heating. Uh, maybe it's more effective. You know, we're going around right now. We're, we're trying to uh, create an electrical block in a circular structure by using a, a straight catheter. It doesn't make a lot of sense, right? We have to move the thing all the way around. So maybe by using a circular structure like a balloon, we can do a better job. The problem with that is the veins are actually not circles, they're ovals. And when you push this vein and you end up leaving little, or push this balloon in, you end up leaving little gaps at the top and bottom. You have to kind of move the balloon around a lot, and you tend to not do a lot better. And, and, and to be honest, in, in, in experienced hands, I think still doing the way we do catheter ablation with the radio frequency is perhaps better than doing with the balloon. But they are improving the balloons to make them more adaptable to different sizes of veins. Uh, the other thought was maybe we can do this quicker. As I said, we're doing procedures in two to three hours now, so we, I, think, I don't think that that's going to be a big advantage. There are some advantages to doing this cryo balloon, perhaps in some patients, um, over the traditional radio frequency or heating the tissue. Uh, we do cryo balloons uh, at Duke. Um, to be honest, we do 99% uh, of our ablations with radio frequency. We don't really do this a lot. We did it in, in the beginning. We found we weren't any more effective. We weren't any quicker. It didn't improve our safety. And so we sort of went back to what we were uh, doing and what we were comfortable with. There are some centers that do more of this, but uh, we don't tend to do a lot. There's other balloons, uh, so same kind of idea. Put a balloon in the vein, but now we can use a laser. And this one's actually nice because inside it has a camera for the first time we actually see inside the heart. They blow up with air, and so it creates a little vacuum, and you can actually see what you're doing. It's amazing. So we use a camera inside there, and then we can direct this laser and do the same thing around the veins with this balloon. Uh, that's a picture of one of these lasso catheters I showed you. Well, we can actually do ablation from that. So why not stick that circle thing in the vein and just do heat up the tissue at the same time? We're part of a national research study looking at that catheter right now. And so we've done three or four of these now using the, a, a catheter. It's not approved yet, but we're part of the approval process for this catheter, looking at how effective it is, how safe it is uh, for doing ablation uh, like that. And finally, with our normal catheters, which is the kind we use now that are just the sort of like the sticks, we just move them in and they flex up and down, we can make sure that we're touching the tissue and there's different sensors that they're looking at for improving the way we're doing ablation with our standard equipment that we use right now. So this is a hugely evolving field. Constantly, we're getting new equipment to try, new equipment that we're looking at. Uh, new mapping systems, new ways to look at the heart. And then, as I say, the technique and this firm ablation and other things, they're changing very rapidly. So a couple take-home points that I want to leave you with, uh, and then I'll take some questions. AFib is very, very common. Um, Three million folks, and it's estimated that in folks that are 80 years old or greater, about 20% are walking around in AFib right now. Many of them don't know it, but it's so common as you get older that many, many folks over 80, certainly over 70, but really over 80, uh, have atrial fibrillation. Treating and preventing stroke is paramount. And so the first question I always answer uh, is, what's your risk for stroke? Uh, what medicine should you be on? And are you taking your medicine? Because that's the most important uh, part of atrial fibrillation. <laughs> the drugs that we use for atrial fibrillation are terrible. I mean, to be honest, I wish we had a much better drug. Uh, there's not a lot coming. But the effectiveness are somewhere between 30 and 50 percent. A lot of side effects are very difficult to take. A lot of patients want to come off them. Catheter ablation is not perfect. We cannot fix atrial fibrillation 100 percent of the time. Right now, we can fix atrial fibrillation 70% of the time, 
78 percent of the time in folks who are in and out, and about 50 percent of the time in patients who are persistently in AFib. But I'm hopeful that we're getting better at that with new technologies. And you live in a great area for AFib. We, uh, you really do. It's amazing. The, there's a lot of AFib here. I live in a great area for AFib. There's a lot of AFib around. But the research of AFib, this is the hub. We, uh, as I said, two of the three medicines that you see advertised in the Super Bowl were studied here at Duke. Uh, and the, the trial that will tell us how we manage AFib going forward for the next several decades is being run by the Mayo and by Duke. So you are at the center of it. And um, there's a, we have a lot of access to um, all of this technology uh, here. And there's a lot of experts here. Here at Duke Raleigh, uh, we have built a lab so that I, myself and my partner, uh, Dr. Atwater, can do AFib ablations here locally in Raleigh. Um, we've been doing AFib ablations at Duke uh, since uh, the late 1990s. Um, and we have four of these labs at Duke. Uh, now we have an identical lab here at Duke Raleigh, and this is just down the hall from us, and this is a picture of our lab. You can actually got this off the website, so you can click on each of these little eyes, and it'll tell you what this piece of machinery is. This was about, I think, about a $13 million lab, so with all this equipment, it's quite expensive. This is the x-ray. Uh, there's a bunch of different mapping things. We look at electrical. I literally have to look at eight screens at once. I use my feet and my hands. I played a lot of video games when I was a kid, and I think that's uh, part of why I do this. Um, but it's, it's constant uh, uh, input of information. And this is our lab, and the, and the patient lays here on this table. You know, with all that money, the mattress is like this thin. I don't understand, but everybody gets complaints of hip um, sciatica after the mattress is absolutely terrible. Um, so this is our lab just down the hallway. Um, we're doing ablations two days a week here. Um, I typically will do two a day, and so we're doing three to four uh, with Dr. Atwater and myself, uh, three to four AFib ablations uh, a week here. And we, and at, at Duke, and all told, we do about uh, six to 800 a year. So very, we're by far the highest center in the, US, in the um, southeast. Uh, so I'll end it there. And I, I had one more. Uh, you might want to switch back to that um, for how to contact us. But um, the, uh, the contact of one uh, 888 duke um, is probably the best um, contact. Uh, we certainly can give you more information about AFib. Um, I'm happy to talk to you, and or if you want to make an appointment, um, 1888-ASK-DUKE is, um, is the general number that you can call. So I'll end it there, and um, I'm happy to take uh, any and all questions that you have. <laughs>